I just love working with people with dementia because they're not gone yet. They're still here and they still have so much to say and so much creative potential. So for everyone who's online today and joining us here at Dementia Spring, it's my great pleasure to be interviewing Erica Curcio. Uh, based out of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Erica is a registered art therapist, a licensed mental health counselor. Uh, she has been an art therapist practicing with folks who have dementia in their homes, at assisted living facilities for years. So welcome to our little Dementia Dialogues, Erica. Uh, I am so glad to be here. I'm so glad. How did you get started down this path of art therapy and how did you end up connecting with the dementia community? I went to, I got my bachelor's in interior design. I went to Louisiana mm -hmm. State University and um, it just wasn't, it wasn't the right fit for me. I couldn't find a job after I graduated and I ended up doing cake decorating. <laughs> and yeah, right. it, so the sculptural art form so I started doing cake de decorating and it was through cake decorating that I really felt like I found myself and I realized, wow, there are so many easy things that people can do with cake that look so rewarding. <laughs> and I was on this mission. I was like, I'm going to go be a cake therapist. Well, there's no such thing as a cake therapist. <laughs> so I found art therapy, it looked at a couple of schools and I said, you know, I want to work with kids. I want to do teach them how to do art with cake and I want them a the resiliency model, right? So I want yep. them to feel really good and confident about themselves with these easy skills that I can teach them. And I was like, I'm going to get a cake truck and I'm going to go to schools. And like, this was my master vision. Um, and then <laughs> I got great. to, I got to graduate school and they said at orientation, try something you didn't think you'd want to try. Like go do your internship and do things that you don't think you're going to want to do. Just try these things out. So I applied to an assisted living like, and I loved my grandparents and I that was my only connection to older people. And um, the minute I walked into that assisted living, I was hooked. I just fell in love. So I did an art therapy internship and um the rest is really history. I wow. just I went on this mission and I just love older adults. And That's amazing. You know, that, that like really mimics my journey a little bit, which is oh, that really? I, I did my pediatrics rotations and was like, no, thank you. I love kids. I want to have some, but I can't do this every day. And I was always good with older people and always really loved being around older people, listening to them and hearing their stories um, and you know, bringing a little bit of light to their day, especially in places like assisted living and nursing homes. And I went to the nursing home world where all of my colleagues were like, God help me, I'm not going to the nursing homes. Um, so I totally can empathize with you. That's amazing. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about art therapy. I mean, you talk about the power of art therapy and, and, and obviously your training comes through because you talk about art therapy in terms of discovery, control, um, you know, languages, speaking. Yeah, I, so we speak through art and we don't even realize that we're doing it. So art can be something that we're looking at. It can be something that we're creating. It can be something that um, is, is decorating our house, but it's there for a reason. It's, it's how, it's one of the ways that we can speak and it's it says things about us and so how does that relate to someone living with dementia well the marks that they make are all they're pretty meaningful because they're there for a reason you know sometimes when i work with someone privately and they're doing art i think to myself well other people wouldn't call this art but this is just as important as a picasso because it has a story to tell. It has a before, a middle, and an end. And it has, and it lives on, and it's tangible. And what is also just incredible about it is, as people are moving along in the disease process, they're losing language. What that looks like to them, it looks mm -hmm. individualized, right? <laughs> but, you know, I could be living with aphasia and have no words. 
or I could just be dropping some words as I'm talking, but you can kind of still get the gist of what I'm saying. But through the creation of art, I've seen people talk that I like as they're creating, or they might say something about their art that they wouldn't otherwise be able to get those words together to say. And it's in those moments I realized that like, there's the power. I'm giving somebody a voice. And it's not even me that's giving them the voice. It's the art supply that's giving someone the voice. It's the colors that they're choosing. And it's, it's, a, it's a visual description of them in their own way. And you watch that, you, you talk about how that, you can see it inspiring confidence. Like you're inspiring creativity, but it's also giving them a sense of confidence and a sense of control that you know has largely been stripped away from many people with dementia. Yeah, my big thing is I say that when I'm working with someone, I'm giving them choices that meet them where they are. So I'm not throwing out all the colors and being like, choose a color. I am giving them four or five colors to choose from. So they're able to make a successful choice. And it's not a right or wrong. It's a their choice. There is no, it's supposed to be the color blue. Like there's no, the, the specifics aren't there. So they're getting that choice. And when I get to make choices, I feel in control. And so that's my other C. So choice, control. And when I feel in control, I feel really good about myself. So I feel confident in myself. So when I have choices, I feel in control and I feel confident. And what more do we want to give people, anyone in this world, to feel confident in themselves, right? We're all aspiring to feel confident. And so people living with dementia lose that confidence because they have this awareness that something's not right with them and they can't, they can't do the things that they used to. So I'm just not gonna do it, right? I don't wanna show people that I can't do it. So when we meet them at their level, we give them those choices, they feel in control and they feel confident. And, and that's it, that's my job. Choice, control, and confidence. And then, and then, as you say, get out of the way. Yeah, I get out of the way. And they just, they just go. And it's just wonderful, this creative flow. There's another C. Um, this creative flow starts to take over, and the huh. person just creates. And they do it their way. And whatever way they do it is theirs. And it's, it's the true way to do it, because it's an expression of them. And, and, and when you're with people, I know coronavirus has made that hard, but when you're with people, you're often with their care partners or caregivers at the same time. And you're, you have to kind of help them sort of stay out of the, you know, pull back a little bit and let the creativity flow. That must be so, it must be amazing to watch the caregivers watch their loved ones start to express themselves through the art. Yeah, but also what's been beautiful is to see care partners, see their loved one, be able to do things that they maybe mm -hmm. thought they couldn't do because yeah. it's presented in such a way that it meets them where they are and it meets everyone where they are. And so we create art via Zoom. And then I also offer an additional coaching call. So the caregiver and I get to talk about what happened and make observations. They get feedback from me and art mm -hmm. therapist. I'm like, how can we make this therapeutic? And yeah. also, you know, what do you think went really well? And what do you think your loved one wanted or didn't want? And um, the feedback from that is just incredible just to hear people and have them see them post on Instagram and they show the art and look, you know, dad created this, mom created that. But also they're showing the daily life of someone living with dementia. They're raising that awareness for the rest of the world. Like this is what my day to day looks like. And I can see in how they talk or the space that they give that they've taken something from it and they're integrating it into other parts of the life. Tell us about an experience with somebody that uh, that's tangible for us. You know, there's some people where it's like instantaneously the connections there between me and them and the art supply. And, and we rock and roll, right? And then there's other times where it takes a few sessions for us to connect and the art supplies to connect. And then once we figure out what works for them, it's like rocket science, right? Mm. And that person knows me. When I show up, I get points. And I will tell, I, it, it happens a lot. Like I just show up and I get a smile and I get a point. But in terms of like an example, um, I was working with someone and 
the first thing that I often bring to people's homes is I bring circles. And then I have them fill in the circles. Circles are wholeness, they're creativity, they keep going, they're a container, they're a safe place. And so I, I like to see what people put in the circle based on what I'm giving them. And so from that, this person put like six dots. It took them 10 minutes, but six dots. But each of those dots meant something. And every mark means something. And I respect that in people's work. And then we made something else. The caregiver that was with them was like, this box is great. Like, we're going to do this with this other project that we did. And then um, I felt like there was a huge connection with that circle, that circle that just didn't seem like there was much in it. I, as an art therapist, felt it. Like, there's something really, really important right there. Person can't articulate what it is, but they were excited by it. And then the next week happens and the caregiver says, they didn't want the box, they wanted the circle. And they, they said, you're right, whatever is there was really, really like the, the, the caregiver liked the box and the tangibility of it, but the person living with dementia was like, that paper is really important to me. That's actually what I got from today was that paper. And then over time, you know, we figure out what works for that person. And this person who went from making very small marks was making huge lines with acrylic paint all over wow. canvas. And that's what we did every single wow. time. And it was just a, an incredible experience to, to, to be a witness to someone literally come alive. It's like go. that, that movie alive inside, like the yep. art supplies just woke this person up. It's, it's just an incredible experience. Like I, I love my job. I just love, working with people with dementia because they're not gone yet. They're still here and they still have so much to say and so much creative potential. And I know some caregivers, by the way, will tell you that after working with you, their behaviors are a little bit different during the day. Sometimes people do a little bit less sundowning, perhaps you can, they use the art perhaps as a tool to distract if it's a bad time of the day or something like that. And I'm sure you've had stories like that shared with you. And I think you've, I think you've, um, talked about that publicly, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I Sometimes people will ask me, well, like, what else can I do with them? Like, what's something I can do? And um, I'm, I, I like to call on sorting. Um, just giving someone, like, if you have beads and they want to sort the beads, like, that's just meeting them at right. base level. Let's see what happens, right? And then maybe those beads next time can turn into, like, create stringing it or, like, whatever you're going to put it on. But or is it itemizing them? Is it like picking out 10? You're stimulating that cognition. These little things seem small, but they're big to the person, right? I can count to 10 with 10 beads. Like these are the red beads and the sorting and the colors. And there's a lot going on yes. when you're asking that of someone. You talk about this idea of emptying the cup. Mm -hmm. tell, tell, yeah. about, tell us about that. So you have a cup, right? I have this cup and anytime something bad happens, let's say that's water. So I keep adding to the cup and I add and I add and I add. And what happens when I add just a little bit more and a little bit more, it starts to overflow. And so when I am working with someone, um, what's happening is I'm helping them empty their cup a little bit and a little bit and a little bit by allowing them to have that self-expression. Mm -hmm. And so they empty that cup just a little bit so that next time something harder comes, they can handle it a little bit easier. And so that's, that's really what the therapeutics do. You know, your expressive therapies or even mm -hmm. just like talking to someone and allowing them to express themselves without us trying to cover it up for them, giving them that opportunity to just so just let it out. It's yes. okay to feel emotions. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to be sad. It's when it's like that for too long, for a very extended, that's when it's a problem. But we all have to feel a range of emotions, even people living with dementia. Yeah, there's no question, right, that people with dementia have a lot of challenges throughout the day, right? There's, there's a lot of opportunity for negativity, right? There's sort of being reminded of things over and over again. There's being internally frustrated that you can't express yourself the way you want to at the right moment. Um, there's, you know, personal indignities where all of a sudden you can't do something physically and somebody has to do it for you. So this idea that um, all that frustration 
that builds throughout every day, really, um, of people's lives, especially if they have more advanced dementia, there's not a lot of routes for expression, right? Yeah. Like you said, words, expressing emotions, that's something very, very blunted. Language gets blunted. So the idea that you've got an outlet, right, through something physical that also is both uh, physical, but also speaking the way you described it, right? The marks, yeah. the marks are like a language. Um, it's very powerful. Yeah, yeah, it's just, I, I am in awe every time, every time. I just can't believe it's my job. I can't believe this is what I do. It's, it's amazing. To help people communicate. It's, it's amazing. Now you obviously have a lot of tools. Tell us a little bit about how you set it up to be successful with people with dementia, knowing that there's some limitations. Yeah, uh, first things first, if you're watching this and you don't know this, uh, depth perception changes over, over time and it, and it gets worse. So I can't tell that my hand has depth or, I, and, or if I have right now below me, I have a laptop on a white table. So I wouldn't be able to tell that like that depth is there. So I cover tables with brown craft paper and I'll work on a white piece of paper. I won't put white on white because it's gonna be really difficult for that person to see the differentiation between the paper and the table. And they're gonna probably go over the, uh, the paper mm. onto the table. Mm. And so they may not even notice it, but you might notice it and you might correct them. And then there it goes, there's a ding, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm just having fun with my paint. <laughs> and and that, that's what I'm doing. Um, I have, again, those choices, less choices, so that the person can, can make their decisions easier. Yes. Um, and they still have the ability to make a decision. I want, you know, which one would you like? Would you like the orange one or the white one? Right. And so they can decide by either grabbing it, saying it, pointing to it. It gives them a few different opportunities to answer that question. And so you want to give them those the list, the host of opportunities to answer the question. Um, and then, you know, everything's out in front of you, but in a clean way, like you're eating dinner, like your table yep. is set, you're setting your table, yes. essentially. And you're having less things than you would have for yourself at that table. Got it. And then you minimize distractions, right? Try to keep the room a little bit quieter. Yes, yes, that's so important. Uh, people living with dementia, as it gets worse, lose their ability to multitask. Yes. And that's huge. So they can only focus on one thing. And again, depending on where you are in the disease process, it's going to change. But I like general rule of thumb. I need this person to focus on one thing. So when they are doing the art, I'm actually not talking. It's hmm. the quietest I ever am is when I'm with somebody living with dementia. Because if I talk to them, I'm pulling them out of what they're doing. They yeah. look up. And then they try to answer my question. And then how do I get them re-engaged with what's in front of them? Because now they're oriented to me and not the paper or whatever they're working on. So I actually don't talk until they lift their head up and they look at me for some kind of reassurance. And then, and then we might chat a little and then they'll go back to it. But that creative flow, I like to leave somebody in it because that's where the magic's happening. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, there is pretty good research, right, into the effect of art therapy on various disease processes, including cancer, pediatric diseases, dementia, Parkinson's, et cetera. I don't know if uh, if you're familiar with all of that research uh, um, professionally, but yeah. uh, feel, free yeah. to feel free to educate us about it. Yeah, I mean, so I'm a member of the American Art Therapy Association, so we have our <laughs> own journal. And yeah. I was happy to see last month, they, we, our newest publication came out and somebody did research on art therapy and spouses in the early stages mm. so it was spousal it was couple therapy using art therapy cool. and um i haven't read it yet but i was so happy to see that research because i feel like it, it's that proving behind the scenes but yeah I, personally i think that art is it's it's with what we want to express inside comes out through the art and so if, uh, let's say an anxiety, right? You're anxious, you're agitated, you just can't, overwhelmed, just can't, can't articulate it. Well, just take some colors, draw a circle and just fill it in and just keep going. And if you give yourself 10 minutes, I guarantee that agitation is going to go down. And, it, and it, I want to say it'll go down a little bit, but I think it's going to go down a lot. 
personally, um, because you're putting it on the paper, you're letting that unconscious take over, and just getting it out. And then write next to it, you know, write out what your process was. It's, it's process based art. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention that before. So art therapy is process based. And so it's all about the process. And it's not about what it looks like at the end. It's about the meaning along the journey. That's great. How hard is it for people to find great people like you across the country? I mean, can you find art therapy in every community in the country who are as advanced as you and sophisticated as you with this? <laughs> well, thank or do, you. Or do we need more? Do we need more art oh, therapy we need, out there? We need so many more. And we need, we need people of all different races and classes and people from all over the world. Like, we need more people doing art therapy and, you know, plug, we need more people working with people living with dementia um, because yeah. that population is even smaller and it can help anyone. So if somebody's watching right now and they have a peaked interest in art therapy, just send me a message because I want you to become an art therapist <laughs> and then I might make you become a dementia specialist. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Erica, this has been a fantastic conversation. I thank yeah. you for what you're doing. You're so passionate. You're making such a difference in people's lives. And we want to stay in touch and we want to hear more about you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was great. It was great to connect with you, Mark. And um, awesome. thank you everybody for watching. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. And uh, we'll catch you later. Bye.